at a remote fishing camp, something has unleashed its wrath. And the refrigerator is ripped from the wall. When Monster Quest first investigated, a legendary creature may have turned up its aggression. This rock on the side of the building was bang. And since then, the cabin has been attacked again. And all of a sudden, something was thrown at the cabin. Now, Monster Quest returns with a new search, a new plan, and a new opportunity to analyze some of the most startling evidence collected. If there is any DNA left there, we should be able to, uh, to read it. And a shocking discovery suggests they may be closing in. It was eight feet tall, blacker than black. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. <laughs> Ontario, Canada, one of North America's great untouched wilderness regions. It is an outdoorsman's paradise. But there is something else here, something that does not want visitors and will turn aggressive to keep them away. Cabin had been uh, broke into. It kind of felt like we were being watched. There's nothing in the woods that can throw a rock. He made such a mess that at first I thought it had to be kids. I didn't believe even an animal would do it, but there's no way for them to get here. I told him, I said, it wasn't a man. I said, it looked like this. It would actually sounded like two individuals, one over here and one over here. I don't think it was trying to play with us. I think we were food. The creature, described by some to be hair covered, six to 10 feet tall, equal to the size of a Kodiak bear, but walking upright, it has 17-inch feet, long arms, and is believed to weigh in at nearly 1,000 pounds and is capable of shaking a fishing cabin to its foundation. It fits the historical description of a Sasquatch. The epicenter of these mysterious creature reports may be Snellgrove Lake, Ontario, just 250 miles north of Manitoba's capital of Winnipeg. In August of 2006, Researchers investigating reports of a threatening creature at the cabin were themselves victims to rocks being thrown during the dark of night. Did you hear that? That rock was pretty good size. It's still shaking. It, was, it sounded to me like it hit on. that side. It hit this. I thought it came over the crest. It was in the to this side. side. And walked to the door. Oh, All right, one of us was urinating off the porch. But when the first stone hit the side of the cabin. And this rock on the side of the building was bang. And it's scary. It's, it's amazing. It's always stuff you hear about that doesn't happen to you. I've been in the woods a lot. I camped a lot. And I was out in the woods all by myself last night. Camera crews scanned the immediate area with night vision and thermal cameras. Yeah, this, yeah. Is so weird. This, is, this is quite exciting, I have to admit. I've not experienced anything quite this dramatic before. One researcher threw a rock back into the woods. Uh, and that was followed shortly after by a, a rather larger rock uh, bouncing down the roof of the cabin. Um, this is quite, quite distinct. Uh, obviously, there's nothing in the woods that's uh, recognized anyway that can lob rocks in that fashion. We're all together. I'm with everybody, so I know that it's nobody goofing around. A cameraman scouted around the area, while others on the team observed from the cabin. We've turned down the lights inside and so we can get a better view through the windows and just see if anything goes through our uh, line of sight. I'm afraid for the first time, and it was for sure a rock, and it was for sure on the roof of the building. A search of the area the following day confirmed their suspicions. A rock the size of a tennis ball was found on the roof. Who? or what had thrown it. Perhaps the creature that left this, a 17-inch bloody footprint. In 2002, at the same isolated cabin, something unknown completely ransacked the interior. Nearly everything was ripped from the walls, including the bathroom sink. Everything was on the floor. Cabin owner Chuck Mossbeck is quite certain it wasn't due to vandals. There's no way in other than flying in. The likely culprit, a bear, was ruled out for several reasons. 
this is sometime between October 1st and the middle of the winter. Bears up that far north, towards the north edge of their range, should be in hibernation during that time. Wildlife biologist Dr. Lynn Rogers, who specializes in black bear research in Ely, Minnesota, explains why the damage to the refrigerator is significant. If they go for the refrigerator, they very often uh, are not going so much for the contents in there, but for the insulation. And formaldehyde is one of the ingredients of making this, and it breaks down into formic acid, which smells like uh, an ant colony. And so then you look for bite marks and, and claw marks where they tore open the inside of the refrigerator to get the, to the insulation. I didn't see any of that in this case. As a deterrent, the owner of the cabin had laid out a bed of screws, and it worked. A 17-inch bloody footprint was left behind, along with tissue. MonsterQuest retrieved the tissue, and subsequent DNA analysis revealed potentially startling results. And I found that it was identical to human DNA, except it had one nucleotide polymorphism. That nucleotide that was different was a difference that is shared with chimpanzees. I got DNA that was primate DNA. According to some scientists, there is only a one in 5,000 chance the DNA is human, and further testing is required. The thing we have to do now is we have to look at more DNA. We have to sequence more of it. We have to design primers to amplify different regions of the DNA so that we can get sequence across the mitochondrial genome and determine whether or not it is just human DNA which seems unlikely that something that a human would step on that board like that. In an effort to identify the origin of the nail board samples, further DNA analysis will be conducted. MonsterQuest will send the tissue samples to an institution that will pick up the testing where Nelson left off. At the same time, a new team of researchers returns to the shores of Snellgrove Lake in search of more evidence. Dr. Jeff Meldrum, a professor of anthropology at Idaho State University, was part of the 2006 expedition. He is returning to the isolated camp for a second time to find out just what was throwing rocks at him during his last visit. Well, on this trip, I, I'm hoping that we'll have the good fortune of a repeat occurrence of what uh, transpired last time. Let's stay here. Just We've had action, though. We've had rocks yeah. thrown at us. And uh, get some photographic evidence to correlate with the, the rock-throwing activity that we experienced last time. But the team will need more than photographic evidence for the scientific community. Uh, zoology wants a type specimen. They want some bone, some DNA, some skin, or a body. Dr. Greg Bambinek, a psychiatrist and wildlife right. expert, has come prepared. And that's why I've got a gun with a, a biopsy dart to get the DNA, a gun with a transmitter dart so we can uh, follow the critter with a Yagi antenna and either see where he lives or, or even with an airplane and get some real close-up photos um, and get some of the evidence that's needed so science can take this a little more seriously. I want to know more about the area. I want to know if it's, if it's feasible that an animal uh, of that size uh, with the ability to throw, that's an egg, could live in this area what other animals live in this, in, in this area, and what it is that they're eating. Joining Meldrum and Bambinek is primatologist Esteban Sarmiento. With over 30 years' experience studying primates in the field, including great apes, Sarmiento is a published author and is well recognized within the scientific community. Having someone see that this animal that has access to the scientific community would make its importance much more emphasized. Uh, an experienced and, and well uh, reputation field primatologist such as Esteban uh, taking interest in the evidence and the data that have, have accumulated to date and, and uh, making the effort to come and investigate for himself I think is an important step forward. Repeating his role from the 2006 expedition, Doug Hycheck will oversee the technical aspects of the mission. Hycheck is a wilderness television producer and camera expert who believes that implementing surveillance technology is key. I've been very successful in helping develop very simple camera systems for animal surveillance, and I've applied some of those 
techniques here, and uh, I'm really hoping that uh, we'll have some luck in getting close-up footage of one of these things. Rounding out the team is Hicheck's son and technical assistant, Blaine Hicheck. Three years ago, uh, we had some rock throwing, some wood knocking, and uh, made me very curious as to what uh, has been doing this. So I think, think that uh, maybe this time, since we brought more technology, we might be able to see what it is. The team plans to use a three-pronged approach. Infrared cameras mounted on the cabin, camera traps hidden around the perimeter of the forest, and audio and video recorders that will be running continuously inside a custom-made blind. Before leaving Minneapolis, Hytrick had a canvas tent-like structure designed to conceal the glow of their electronic equipment at night and hide the person assigned to monitor the video screens. Uh, the blind, I think, is, a, is an excellent uh, strategy. It allows us to uh, portray the appearance of having everyone having gone to bed or the cabin being quiet, while yet uh, some of us are, are still hard at work uh, uh, monitoring the perimeter of the cabin. The list of gear and supplies the team will need for 12 days is extensive. It will take the plane several trips to transport all the gear. The view from the air shows just how isolated the cabin is. The camp is the only dwelling on the lake, and the only way in is by float plane. The team will be on their own. After unloading the gear, the first order of business is to set up the blind. You can't see through. I mean, it's pitch black when you're outside. Yeah, yeah. We got to figure out where the door is. Once the blind is assembled, they must then create their surveillance network. Do you guys want to hook up all your camera systems? Plug in the power to all your camera systems. Okay, it looks like all four are working. Let's do it. Let's install these. All right, all right. The first step is we're going to drill holes. Yeah. <coughs> Chuck's not going to like us. Infrared cameras will be mounted in strategic positions on each side of the cabin, networked back to the monitors in the blind. Each camera has an invisible infrared light source, which allows the camera to capture images in total darkness. Right there, but a little bit to the left. Keep the same height. And we'll get them all installed, then we'll go through and we'll tweak them all with angle and whatnot. I just want to get this done before an April. Let's go. Number two. All right. We only got That's going to be on the other side. The cameras are strategically mounted on the eaves of the cabin. The objective is to avoid alerting the intruder that it is being watched. Looks like there's something obstructing the right side. That looks good. We're ready for final install. After some final adjustments, everything is set. The cameras will be monitored from the blind inside the cabin. The crew decided that I had the first shift. At the first sign of any activity, Hycheck will alert the rest of the team. Nightfall brings not only darkness, but an almost deafening silence over the isolated fishing camp. But could evidence collected from another frightening encounter at Snellgrove reveal the identity of the monster? We can really start to see some of the microscopical features that allow us to make the identification. This isolated fishing cabin on Snellgrove Lake, Ontario, has long been the target of aggressive attacks by an unknown creature. In some cases, the aggression was focused on the cabin itself. Other times, it was seemingly directed at the inhabitants. In 2002, the cabin was completely ransacked. In 2006, Monster Quest researchers were the targets of rock throwing, and they collected DNA evidence that points to a primate. In 2007, the attacks continued. Well, in 2007, there was a bunch of us that, uh, well, actually five of us that went up fishing uh, at Snow Grove Lake. Dave Regal was a member of a fishing party staying at the cabin. His second night at Snowgrove Lake would be a night he will never forget. Because it doesn't take me long to fall asleep, and I was tired and relaxed, and um, I'm a sound sleeper. And 
all of a sudden heard this big crash and didn't know if somebody fell out of bed. I kind of sat up, looked around in our room because there was three of us in our room and everything was fine and started to lay back down and all of a sudden there was another, like something was throwing at the cabin and the cabin kind of shook. And not knowing, it woke all of us up. And uh, we all went out into this big room where the dining area is and saw that out on the, through the patio doors, out on the deck, table was knocked over, chair, the rod case, my rod case, which is about six and a half feet long, was laying down uh, like it had bounced back off something. Whatever shook the cabin may also have left behind a clue on Regal's rod case, a clue that could point to the identity of the attacker. One of the things that we noticed once daylight came, and it was one of the fellows just happened to, to see it, was down on, I have a name tag that's on this case, uh, and there was a, a long hair on it. And picked it up and didn't really think too much about it, but uh, they thought, well, maybe we should take this back. Could this hair belong to the creature that terrorized the cabin? Or is it possible that it was already on the rod case before the case was thrown? Will we be able to identify whether or not this hair is human or non-human? Jay Beckett is a microscopist with Microtrace, a private independent laboratory specializing in the identification of small quantities of unknown materials. He will be examining the hair to determine its origin. Uh, it came from Canada. It was uh, involved in some sort of mysterious disturbance at a cabin in a remote location, and uh, it was sent to us for identification. To positively identify the hair, it will be necessary to compare it to other known samples. So here at Microtrace, we maintain a physical reference collection of both human and animal hair. And currently, we have uh, over 1,500 uh, animal hair samples that have been cataloged and are accessible via our database. As the hair undergoes initial study and testing, the team out at Snellgrove Lake is hoping to collect additional evidence. Blaine Hijack has been up all night watching the monitors for activity, but the first night proves to be uneventful. Day two, the plan is to deploy camera traps in the surrounding forest. Accompanying the cameras will be scent lures to appeal to the creature's sense of smell. We're using a lot of olfactory uh, cues to try and draw it in because that's what you do when you're hunting an animal. And you want to draw them in to get a close-up with, with the camera traps. Sandwiched between two pheromone ships is a radio transmitter. Transmitters are typically used by biologists for tracking wildlife. In the event it is moved, the team will be able to track it electronically. Oh, boy. Well, only seven more to do. The bait and camera stations are positioned at strategic points in the vicinity of the cabin to try to capture the attention of whatever may be lurking nearby. While Babinek puts out the rest of the traps, Sarmiento plans to determine if this habitat can sustain a large primate-like animal. You know, if it's a mammal that exists and it's real, like all other mammals, it has certain necessities. It has to breathe, it has to eat, and it has to reproduce. It's the food, really, that sort of tells you it has to be in certain areas. In addition to spruce grouse, identified as a potential food source in a previous expedition, Sarmiento has found other possibilities. The floor here is covered mostly by moss. Some of it is lichen, and as we walk by, we'll be able to see some of the lichen, and lichen's always an, uh, a, a, a food for animals. Ferns, which are also plentiful on the forest floor, are a common food source for some animals. 
In the higher areas, raspberry and blueberry plants are thick, though they have yet to fully ripen. Uh, there's no doubt a large primate could sustain himself here. There's just the other large, other large mammals do it. And the, the truth is that a primate is a generalist. He's, he eats a wide variety of foods and um, doesn't really depend on any one food generally. One of the food sources that we can't see are the underwater food sources. And we have an awful lot of lakeshore. And a lot of these food sources where they be cattails, lilies, and another assortment of aquatic and semi-aquatic plants have tubers and they have um, leaves that are really edible to, to, to the animals. And in fact, for an animal like moose, such plants, such aquatic plants, provide a large portion of their diet. So uh, any large animal may come here to get berries, and if it's not a carnivore and it subsists on, on plants, it would doubtless go to the shores to get the tubers and some of their starches. The second night is Sarmiento's turn in the blind. As the minutes turn into hours, morning comes, again, without incident. I, I, I was really hopeful that the night might bring uh, sounds or movements of, of some of the mammals that live here, but the night went without incident. Today, the team will deploy another attractant in an effort to lure the creature in. The scent and the method are unique. Uh, one technique that we're trying on this trip is to use uh, grade ape uh, urine collected during the menstrual cycle. In this case, we have gorilla urine that was collected from a zoo specimen. The scent is intended to appeal to either the creature's primal instincts or its curiosity. This stuff, we're going to be putting on a little tripod. I've developed a little uh, scent odorizer. It's almost like the olfactory organ itself. It's got little leaves, and so the wind is going to carry these pheromones from the gorilla urine out. And we've got a, a southeast wind, and so it's going to go back into the forest. And the end of the dock, they can't get to the end of the dock uh, across water. We're going to draw them right past the cabin, past our cameras that are concealed here. Silence falls over the camp along with the darkness. But little do they know that while Snellgrove is quiet, just over 100 miles away, Sasquatch is making headlines, and DNA testing may be making history. It's uh, basically in the center of a mystery, and we are solving that. For years, this cabin on Snowgrove Lake, Ontario, has been the focus of a menacing attacker, causing destruction and tormenting the inhabitants. For five days and four nights, Monster Quest researchers have been trying to collect evidence of what has been terrorizing the cabin. The team hopes to capture photographic proof of whatever left the tissue sample behind on this board back in 2005. Material clinging to these, the threads on these screws in a few places. Uh, does that look like tissue to you? It kind of does. Subsequent DNA testing yielded an astonishing conclusion. I got DNA that was primate DNA, and I knew that I might be looking at the DNA of a Sasquatch. Now, more extensive DNA testing is underway to find out what left it behind. We have been able to uh, obtain uh, uh, DNA sequences from very old material, very degraded sort of uh, material. Dr. Mirdad Hajibabai is a molecular biologist with the Canadian Centre for DNA Barcoding at the University of Guelph. He believes their unique approach may enable him to solve this mystery. We recently analyzed a sample that is about 150 years old and uh, it's uh, basically in the center of a mystery and we are solving that using the uh, technique that we've developed here. Unlike the process used by Kurt Nelson in 2006, which used specific ape primers, Haji Babai has developed primers capable of amplifying any DNA, making it ideal for unknown specimens. What we do usually is to try to look at a smaller fragments of DNA. We can go after a smaller fragment from that barcode, a mini barcode, and this is typically about 100 base fragments, and oftentimes that 100 base or 100 nucleotide information is enough to, uh, to make a good identification. As Dr. Haji Babai attempts to extract DNA from the tissue collected in 2006, 
The researchers at Snellgrove are hoping to make a visual identification of the beast that has been attacking the cabin. Six nights have passed, and so far their tactics have not provoked an attack. We have tried a lot of things, the wood knocking, call blasting, we've put out the camera traps, baiting with scent, baiting with the, the Sasquatch pheromone chips. We've been trying uh, a lot of things and we haven't had much success. But the next morning, a surprise visit from a local bush pilot brings news that the creature may be near. He just heard that there was two people a woman and a child, they're blueberry picking, and they saw Sasquatch. And find now, out. This, came, he can on, phone this the... came on the airplane radio? No, just the local radio. Local radio. Okay. Further research indicates the location of the sighting is quite close. So they, they saw it around here, grassy narrows. That's what they yep. say, right? Yep, right there. Oh, yeah. Jeff, it's only 115 miles 115 on the GP. Miles. Straight line. Straight, Straight line. line. Do you think it's possible an animal would actually just follow the wave of berries? Oh, sure, I think that would be very likely. Very reasonable possibility. Don't you think, Greg? If yes, and this is a late, um, a late spring around here, and so the blueberries are late. So, yeah, if it's following blueberries, because around here they're small and green, there's a lot of them, so it's going to be a good crop. But, yeah, why be around here if you're eating a lot of blueberries when you've got to be 100 miles yeah. southwest? Bears are known to migrate in search of food. Is it possible that this creature would as well? There are documented stories that suggest Sasquatch eats blueberries. An affidavit from William Rowe in 1955 describes the following encounter that happened on Micah Mountain, just 80 miles west of Jasper, Alberta. Rowe had just come out of some brush into a clearing when he saw what he thought was a grizzly bear in the blueberry bushes. A moment later, it stepped into the clearing, and Rowe quickly realized it was not a bear. He estimated the creature to be six feet tall, almost three feet wide, and 300 pounds, covered head to toe with dark brown, silver-tipped hair. The creature squatted down on its haunches and reached out its hands. It pulled the branches of berry bushes toward its mouth and ate. Upon seeing Rowe, the creature stood upright and walked away on two legs. Could the lack of blueberries at Snellgrove explain the lack of activity? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it, it lends sort of a, an, a, a very plausible ecological explanation for why this year seems to be different than the previous years. Day eight, the float plane is back with more news of the sighting. Talked to the gentleman's wife yeah. oh. yesterday, because I called, this is, this is the lady that saw the Bigfoot. This is the gentleman, which I believe is her brother or brother-in-law. He went there, talked her into going back, and he brought the casting stuff, took a casting. He said they found the footprints, made their castings, they saw where it was eating berries, yeah. everything. With the report only a week old, and only 115 miles between Snowgrove Lake and Grassy Narrows, the team decides to shift the location of its search. Uh, we were scared. I had no idea what it was. It wasn't a bear or moose, she stressed. It was upright and walking. It's like you're going to Grassy Narrows. OK. Could what they find be an undiscovered species? It was eight feet tall, um, uh, pitch black. For centuries, northern Canada has been home to mysterious reports of strange creatures with sometimes aggressive behavior. And in recent years, something has been leaving its violent mark at this isolated fishing cabin at Snellgrove Lake, Ontario. DNA collected at the site was analyzed and found to be that of a non-human primate. The result raised as many questions as it answered. Now, MonsterQuest is testing it more extensively to reach a definitive conclusion. But this is not the only physical evidence from Snowgrove Lake. In 2007, Dave Regal reported that he and others in his party were the victims of an attack in the dead of night. Like something was throwing at the cabin. Hair collected from that fishing rod case is being analyzed for evidence of its species. Does it belong to a human? 
are a creature of unknown origin. Right now we're observing the hair under approximately 400 times magnification, going up to our highest powered objective, and now we're viewing the hair at roughly 630 times magnification. And we can really start to see some of the microscopical features that allow us to make the identification. As the examination continues at Microtrace, the team at Snellgrove Lake has decided to cut their stay short in order to investigate a creature sighting 115 miles to the south. After retrieving the camera traps, they pack up camp and head to Grassy Narrows. Well, the past seven days have not yielded much, so it might be good to go move to where there's actually been a sighting. Located just 181 miles from Winnipeg, Grassy Narrows is an Ojibwe First Nation settlement with a population of just over 800. After the initial flight into Kenora, Ontario, it's just a two-hour ride by car to interview the witnesses at Grassy Narrows. I thought I was seeing things. Helen Papasse and her mother encountered the creature as they were pulling up to one of their favorite blueberry picking spots. We come to a, a winding road, and then all of a sudden, this black figure comes on, and she says in Ojibwe, what is that coming towards us? And I looked at her, I said, did you see that too, Mom? And she said, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's saying she was so, um, she couldn't believe, she couldn't believe what she'd just seen. It was eight feet tall, um, uh, pitch black. I'd say blacker than black. We seen it walk off and into the bush. Suggestions that it may have been a bear are quickly dismissed. But this thing was upright upright, human-like, but it still didn't look human. It was a creature. To me, it looked, I don't know, it just, it wasn't, I know it wasn't an animal. The beast was so disturbing that Helen's mother refuses to ever return. She says it ruined her blueberry picking, her rice picking, and to go out there alone, this, this thing ruined it all, she said. Helen's brother convinced her to show him where she saw the creature. We searched this area, and this one spot by the, uh, by the mud puddle there, that's where we found a, a real good print. There, there was some uh, bear tracks. We could, it's obvious there were bear tracks. But, but this print, you could tell it's human-like. Randy Fobister says other evidence left behind raises many questions. Okay, so there's branches that are broken that's way too high. A moose couldn't, his neck wouldn't be long enough to reach there and grab those sticks. So we thought, we thought that was weird, the way those sticks were uh, broken and bent down, just a few. Fobister takes the researchers out to the area where the sighting occurred. So is this the spot, Randy? Yeah, yeah, this, that's, yeah, that's the spot. Signs indicate the area is well traveled by bear and other wildlife. But the researchers are anxious to see where the footprints were found. Perhaps there are others, or more importantly, physical evidence left behind. Where that, where that red tape is, that's where we had found the, the, good, the good print where we could actually uh, put the, the pl plaster on. But first, Meldrum wants to take a look at the cast. I don't know if that looks like a... Well, this is interesting. You could see those six toes, eh? But I, I didn't really do a good job of uh, putting the plaster on. Right. Um, the Sasquatch tracks that I'm familiar with, uh, being a primate, they have a very distinctive and very round, broad heel pad mm -hmm. un under that heel bone. Yeah. And it makes a, a very distinct, not a distinctively round um, heel. Meldrum believes the print may have been made by a bear. You've got the possibility of a forepaw right here, one forepaw, and then you have this nice series of toes, one, two, three, four, five, and and the curve right there of another pad 
In fact, this would be the adult and this would be the, the cub. Two prints overlapping each other could account for length, width, and the additional toes. However, when compared to the print of a bear, differences come to light. So, I mean, by comparison to this adult bear, that big toe is, is pretty large. I mean, even the largest uh, toe on a bear, which is the outside toe, this would be the, the right paw, the outside toe is usually the largest, um, it still doesn't quite fit the bill for this toe here. Because of the condition of the substrate material from which the print was taken, it is difficult for Meldrum to come to a definitive conclusion. But a search of the area soon turns up something else. Oh, it's too, it's really a little bit too big to be bear. What do you think about that, huh? Nestled on the shoreline of Ontario Snowgrove Lake, a cabin sits alone in the vast Canadian wilderness. Solitary, but for one uninvited and destructive visitor who watches and waits. This isolated cabin has been the focus of physical attacks. Too remote and inaccessible to be vandalism and too powerful to be a bear. This man says he was inside as the creature shook the building. This man says something destroyed the interior. This expert says it wasn't caused by bears. This team of researchers is determined to solve the mystery, and this scientist may already have the answer. Dr. Merdan Hajibabai has been extracting DNA from tissue samples collected from a nail board left out at the cabin as a deterrent. We had three specimens, and uh, one uh, is a hair uh, sample, and, uh, and there are two sort of uh, uh, tissue type. Previous testing indicated primate DNA. However, further analysis was required to make a definitive identification of the attacker. It looked quite uh, degraded. I, I, my understanding is that this, these uh, have been collected uh, a few years ago. The material that we received, we, uh, uh, we did a rigorous testing on it uh, to, to purify the DNA and to, uh, to amplify these barcode regions using different primers and different settings. Uh, this allows us to look for uh, different groups of organisms. And uh, the DNA that came from the material uh, uh, belongs to uh, fungi and, uh, and bacteria. These are harm harmless fungi and bacteria from environment. They can be on soil uh, or water. And uh, so uh, we did not find any, uh, any animal uh, DNA uh, or any primate uh, DNA. So why would the results differ with those of the first test done in 2006? One possibility is that the first test may have contained human DNA as a result of contamination. Or perhaps the sample is now too degraded to extract DNA at all. We might be able to, to design uh, uh, some, uh, some new tests using uh, next generation of, uh, of sequencing, uh, uh, DNA sequencing machines. The Snellgrove expedition team has shifted the focus of their search to Grassy Narrows, the location of a recent Sasquatch sighting. Oftentimes things come to my attention that are years or even decades old. And uh, uh, it's, it's a very different situation to be able to interview a witness with very fresh memories of, of an event, of an encounter, of their impressions of, of what it is they saw. Interviewing witnesses may offer insight, but more significantly, there could be other evidence here. Right, here's some, some more disturbances here. The team searches the area for other footprints or signs of the creature. There is a great deal of evidence of wildlife. Yeah, this seems like it's been torn open by some animal looking for grub, and now chances are it's a bear. And I guess you can see here, it looks like that's a claw mark. That's a claw mark. The heavy traffic from curiosity seekers has made the search more difficult. So you can see some of the grass has been trampled here that were here before. This is where I found the berry. Here's these berries. I don't know what kind of berries those are. 
June berries, huh? And yet, right next to a berry bush, Sweet. a sign. And the animal's been eating June berries. That's the raspberries. I just, I just ate a raspberry. What is that, bear or? Oh, it's too, it's really a little bit too big to be bear. Can you see the? That's the... Hmm. What do you think about that, huh? A fresh track means a fresh trail. It, it, it's partly it being opened, but this is all this has all been smashed down. That extrusion right there, right here. Yeah. But sure, it sure it seems to have a ridge here in the middle going this way. So these are the toes, little toes. These are this is the big toe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of definition, but it's definitely something big that. Yep. put its weight there, and it doesn't seem like it's human. No. And, it, and I can't see how it could be a bear. Whatever it is, it's good size, right? The size and impression of the track leaves them to question just what could have made that footprint, and is it following the crop of berries? Questions that fuel the mystery surrounding Sasquatch. Obviously, there's signs of animals, like lots of them. And the reason they're there is because there's a lot of food here. Raspberries and blueberries, I mean, there's whole hills covered with them. When the previous attacks on the cabin at Snowgrove Lake occurred, various berries, including blueberries, were fully ripe. This year, spring and summer have come late to Snowgrove, and the berries are delayed. But 115 miles south at Grassy Narrows, the berries are at their peak. Could this be another clue to the identity of the creature? Animal migrations are known to follow available food sources. And while a comparative analysis between Ontario Sasquatch sightings and berry ripening patterns does not yet exist, it is possible the two overlap. The Snell Grove trip was in some ways disappointing, but in other ways it was a real education for me. In short, we were in the right place, but at the wrong time. While it is still unclear why the creature returns to the isolated cabin on Snowgrove Lake, perhaps other evidence can determine what it is. The hair on the rod case from 2007 may still hold the answer. So we have the hair that was sent from Canada mounted up for examination. We have it under the polarized light microscope being viewed at approximately 630 times uh, magnification. And you can see here as a longitudinal view of the hair, we have the cuticle, which is the outermost layer of the hair running on the edges, top and bottom. Uh, everything in the middle of the hair is cortex, and you can see the light brown pigment granules that are dispersed uh, in that cortex. Um, there is no medulla, the innermost portion of the hair, um, in this particular hair. Uh, the medulla is absent, where it, if it had been present, it would be running down the middle of the hair here, but you can see there is no medulla. Beckert explains the absence of medulla can be a natural variation in some human hairs. However, his examination reveals another unexpected discovery. And you can see by looking here that this region of the hair has been bleached. Um, it's colorless in this region, and it has the characteristic texture of a hair that has been bleached. In order to confirm the hair has been bleached, Beckett conducts a staining test. The hair is placed in blue dye, then washed thoroughly. If the hair has been bleached, the dye will remain. So we have the hair um, after it has been uh, stained with the methylene blue uh, and it has been thoroughly washed and now we see that the hair has retained the blue color of the stain and the fact that the hair has retained that blue color uh, indicates that this hair has been uh, artificially bleached and it is a human head hair most likely of a Caucasian. But the mystery remains what threw the rod case at the cabin. The body of evidence in support of a large creature prowling the Ontario wilderness is mounting. Eyewitnesses who claim to have seen the creature. A possible migratory pattern linked to the ripening of an abundant food source. And repeated attacks on the isolated cabin. You know, it has to either be a human or it has to be one of these animals. It has to be something with hands. It just can't be any other explanation for it. These rocks and logs aren't falling out of the sky. Uh, moose don't throw logs. Bears don't throw logs. And so I really also want to solve the mystery. Given the right tools, uh, I think science can solve the mysteries. I'm confident about it. This is an enormous area. 
and you know that it could support something that's totally new there's no doubt about that whether uh, it does is another question